Hello everyone, I'm Brior, and welcome back to my coverage of the history of Good Game Empire. We're talking about 2016 today. It was a turbulent time at Good Game Studios, but a pretty solid year for the game. In January, the Alliance Tournament made a comeback, although players were surprised to see that the task was now to collect seasonal points rather than to collect glory. As we've discussed in prior episodes of this series, Good Game Studios was evidently concerned about players being able to game the system of collecting glory by attacking friendly players or even their second accounts. The first significant update of the year came in February, when Good Game Studios introduced build items. Build items replaced The Alchemist, an old event that somehow escaped being covered in prior episodes. The Alchemist may have been added as far back as 2011, which, as we talked about earlier in the series, was before updates were properly documented on the forums. While the Alchemist was active, players could collect ingredients by attacking robber baron castles. The Alchemist could turn these ingredients into potions that players could use to temporarily increase the productivity of certain buildings, like farmhouses. While a building was under the effect of the Alchemist, it was given a glowing outline. For whatever reason, Good Game Studios silently discontinued The Alchemist, and by 2016, players had long since stopped seeing it appear in the game. Enter the build items. To unlock this feature, the player had to build the construction yard, which became available at level 45. At the construction yard, players could browse their inventory of build items and assign them to the primary and appearance slots of other buildings. Example build item effects included increased recruitment speed, extra troops on the wall, and additional food storage. Build items would only become active, so to speak, once assigned to a building. At first, only the bakery, barracks, keep, military hospital, and drill ground had build item slots. As the name suggests, appearance build items transformed the appearance of the building to which they were assigned. The art team at Good Game Studios got pretty creative players' castles began to look more colorful, if a bit less realistic. Appearance build items also provided a public order bonus, albeit typically a minuscule one. While Good Game Studios planned from the beginning to allow players to craft build items, build items were initially only available as event rewards and through paid sources like Ruby Offers and the Armor. Build items added significant complexity to the game. The construction yard could be built in each of the player's seven permanent castles, so there were a lot of build item slots to fill. Each time Good Game Studios released a better build item, the process of filling these slots effectively restarted. The flip side of this was that build items provided a great and easily implemented source of new event rewards. Unlike with the Alchemist event though, active primary slot build items were not immediately visible in the castle view. To see them, the player had to either go into the construction yard or click on each building individually and examine the dialogue in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. When food production build items were added, players had to be careful to manually slot them in the granaries for the highest workload. The additional base food production added by build items was not taken into account when determining the building's workload. As the game could sometimes recalculate, causing certain granaries to either increase or decrease workload, the player had to periodically recheck his build items. Good Game Studios experimented with various changes to the construction yard to try to better display all of the information about which build items with which effects were embedded where. Ultimately, however, this screen has always been kind of busy, though maybe that's just me. It may also be only my opinion that Good Game Studios overcomplicated things, by creating both food production and base food production build items, and then later relic food production and relic base food production build items. Don't forget the premium build items as well. While it was initially possible to go into other players' construction yards and see what build items they were using, Go Game Studios took that feature out. On the whole then, the build item system made it more difficult to assess the strength of other players by looking at their castles, or to learn from their strategies. Luckily, as we recently discussed, might points were now a thing. One other thing the build items did, and this I think was a positive, is they increased the attractiveness of keeping certain buildings like the military hospital in the castle. You see, by 2016, 
there was a real risk that players would simply remove all buildings that did not increase food production and be left with very basic castles. Indeed, to a large extent, that has always been the winning strategy in Good Game Empire. Why build dwellings and tax citizens when you can just loot coins from NPCs? Why build woodcutters or stone quarries when, again, those resources too could be looted from NPCs? Food production, by contrast, remained relevant as it determined how many soldiers you could feed while you were offline. Each building that did not increase food production effectively harmed it, since the space it took up would otherwise be used to increase public order, which, of course, in turn, would increase the productivity of your granaries. For castle building to continue to be an interesting and strategic part of the game, Good Game Studios needed to incentivize players to construct many different types of buildings. Build items provided a partial answer. This problem was also later alleviated to some extent by relic and mead production buildings. Also in February, yes, that's right, we're still in February, Good Game Studios introduced the Baramond Invasion. This is the version of the battle for Baramond that appears in the Great Kingdom. Players would attack Baramond camps to collect gallantry and reputation points. The camps' defenses were similar to the Nomad and Samurai camps, but the Baramond camps would disappear and respawn after each attack, rather than simply leveling up. This made it more difficult to run chains of attacks against them. Both players and alliances were ranked in this new event. Player rankings were on the basis of reputation points. If you attacked a blue camp, say, you'd gain reputation with the House of Gerbrandt, the Red Faction, but lose reputation with the House of Ursidae, the Blue Faction. The ratio of points gained to points lost was ordinarily one-to-one, -one, so any progress with the Red Faction would set you back with the Blue Faction by the same amount. Premium booster tools, however, would increase the reputation gained without increasing the reputation lost. Accordingly, players could use these tools over the course of the event to collect significant reputation with both factions. Other February changes, yep, still February, included the ability to remove gems and a new premium building called the Willow of Experience. Good Game Studios also began limiting Alliance event rewards to players who had personally participated. In March, Good Game Studios unveiled the Spring Nights Festival, the latest iteration of the LTPE, or as some people call it, the seasonal event. The Baramond Invasion was newly included as an event where you could collect season points. Good Game Studios also added five intermediate levels to the Watchtower, in the process greatly increasing its ruby cost. There was also something called the Battle of Empires, a one-off PvP event where the winner received a trip to Hamburg, Germany to meet the development team. Toward the end of March, Good Game Studios achieved 300 million registered players across its games, including 80 million in Empire and 60 million in Empire Four Kingdoms. April's updates were fairly minor. The Shadow Mercenaries event was made stronger with demon troops, although it remained prohibitively expensive. Good Game Studios added new glory titles, which conferred new effects like faster tool production and Kingsguard defenders. Facebook integration was also added, meaning players could sign in using their Facebook account and also use Facebook to do certain cool things like translate the text in the game. New build items were added for the granary, the woodcutter, and the stone quarry. Finally, Good Game Studios introduced an automatic attack slowdown feature, which made coordinating overnight and mass attacks easier. To avoid your target detecting your attack hours in advance, however, and thereby blowing the cover on your alliance's mass attack, you had to remember to still select a fast travel feather before using the automatic slowdown feature. This was unintuitive, and I'm sure it caused a lot of strategic mishaps. In May, Good Game Studios added the ability for players to sell old decorations for coins. This was useful because at this time in the game's history, you could not move decorations between your castles. Upon earning a decoration, or upon logging into the game after earning a decoration, you had to specifically select a castle that it would be added to. But many players had castles that were already full, uh, and old decorations that needed to be sold. Also in May, the rewards associated with the foreign invasion were increased. In keeping with prior years, 
Good Game Studios launched Empire's biggest update of 2016 in the summer. I'm talking about the Alliance Cities and the battle for the Royal Capital. The community management team at Good Game Studios actually made a patch preview video announcing these new features. So, for a change, I'll let someone other than myself explain how this worked. Hello, lords and ladies of Empire, and welcome to our first ever patch preview video. I'm Steve from our community management team, and today I'll be showing you around our latest feature, the Alliance Cities and the Royal Capitals. So, let's get started. Now, as you can see, me and my Alliance have founded a noble house, and any Alliance that constructs a noble house will get their own Alliance City. You can see this Alliance City on the world map, which we'll look at now. It appears as a world objective, just like the monuments, and spawns in the nearest spot to the Alliance Leader's castle. Once you enter the city's menu, you'll see the standings for the battle for the Royal Capital. We'll come back to this later though. First of all, let's take a look at our Alliance City itself. The Alliance City is a lot different to all of the different buildings we're used to seeing, our regular cities and outposts, with only five plots of land to build on, including the standard walls and gates. Each of these plots has one specific building that can be constructed there, all providing benefits to your Alliance City defences. For example, here we have the Alliance City Keep, that will bring a more powerful castell into your city. All these buildings can be upgraded with your Alliance funds for now, and will require Royal Tokens in the future. One major part of this feature to remember is that your defences are determined by these buildings. Every building that you build will increase the defences and bring you new troops and tools. You can't send your own troops and tools, so you'll have to keep getting stronger with upgrades. If your troops die, they'll automatically respawn, so you can keep on defending till the end. It's also important to remember that you can still set your defences, even though you can't send your own defences. Every now and then, the Battle for the Royal Capital event will begin. Once this starts, you'll be able to access the rankings in your Alliance City menu. As well as the rankings, this screen will show you who the current capital rulers are, if there are any, how many Royal Tokens each Alliance has, and how many they will lose if they are defeated in battle. A percentage of Royal Tokens will be stolen from defeated players, and the more tokens that you have, the more players that will be able to steal from you in an attack. Only Alliances that have their own city will be involved in this battle but anyone can attack the cities for Royal Coins, not stealing any tokens in the process. Royal Coins are generated much like Khan Tablets, and you can use them to buy new equipment and items. When the battle phase is over, the Alliance with the most tokens will have their city upgraded to the Royal Capital. Their name will be displayed in the city menus, and their city will receive a shiny, prestigious new upgrade. There will also be other bonuses available for the Capital Holders. For example, a food production bonus for all Alliance members, and my personal favourite, the display of your royal coat of arms and name on the map of the Great Empire, signifying your rule over the kingdom. Alliance Cities and the battle for the royal capital marked a huge and novel update for Good Game Empire. According to this Good Game Studios blog post, they were a challenge to develop in terms of art, programming, and game design. Alliance Cities went live on the first Monday in June, and the battle for the royal capital started only a day later, giving alliances not much time to upgrade their Alliance City buildings. Over the rest of that week, Good Game Studios pushed out a number of hotfixes to correct bugs with the event. The feedback from the community was that the event, while fun, suffered from certain game-breaking exploits. For example, creating a low-level second account and making that account Alliance Leader would prevent others from sending large attacks against your Alliance City. After all, you can't send large attacks against low-level players. This would effectively make your Alliance City undefeatable, and would prevent your Alliance from ever losing Royal Tokens. Alternatively, passing around Alliance leadership while attacks on the Alliance City were incoming would make those attacks bounce. Relatedly, some Alliances figured out how to get multiple Alliance Cities, which sounds like it would have been a disadvantage, except that it made it more difficult to find the actual Alliance City that you could loot Royal Tokens from. With no prospect of looting Royal Tokens from other Alliances that were using any of these strategies, large Alliances created sub-Alliances or worked with their existing sub-Alliances so that they had Alliance Cities to farm. The whole battle event, then, boiled down to who could create the largest and most cooperative Alliance family. The event fared slightly better after some of these bugs got fixed. The other negative piece of community feedback, though, was that the rewards associated with earning the royal capital were not attractive enough. At only 500 extra units of food per hour, the production bonus was too small, 
and players only kept it until Good Game Studios ran the event again. Good Game Studios later made winning the battle for the Royal Capital more rewarding by providing all members of the winning alliance with a new decoration and a new title. Don't let these issues distract from the big picture, though, which is that the Alliance Cities were an extremely innovative and fun new feature. Other summer updates included a visual rework of the Research Tower, the addition of the Friends List, and a new LTPE called Kala's Contest. The new LTPE introduced a powerful nine-piece Castellan set called Kala's Mysteries. For a long time, this is one of the best free-to-play Castellan sets in the game. In August, Good Game Studios finally added a crafting system for build items. To be able to craft build items, players had to first complete new research at the Research Tower. Then, they needed to obtain materials, which mostly came from randomized material bags that players could purchase for event currencies and earn as LTPE rewards. You could also obtain materials from deconstructing your existing build items, which, of course, would destroy them. Predictably, crafting more powerful build items required rarer materials like resin and soulstone. None of the materials were that hard to get, however. They were simply difficult to acquire in large number. At first, crafting build items was very quick, taking only seconds. Good Game Studios later changed this to take a couple of hours. August also brought a new iteration upon the attack autofill feature. Players could now use presets to save prior attack configurations that they had created either manually or automatically, and then more quickly apply those configurations to subsequent attacks. One preset slot was available for free, but up to five more could be purchased for rubies. Another small change combined the horns for incoming attacks, incoming attacks on Alliance members, and incoming attacks on the Alliance City, decluttering the screen a little. In the middle of August, Good Game Studios celebrated Empire's fifth anniversary. Toward the very end of August, Good Game Studios unveiled another new event, the Blood Crow Invasion, although this was merely a reskin of the Foreign Invasion. It did happen to come with a neat new nine-piece commander set, the Blood Crow Treasures, which started out life as the strongest free-to-play PvP commander set in the game. In the midst of all these updates, which were broadly good for Empire, life at Good Game Studios appears to have been rather turbulent. News broke that the company was laying off 600 employees, which was somewhere between a third to half of its workforce. To phrase all this in the company's terminology, though, Good Game Studios had merely decided to refocus on core competencies. Apparently, its recent games had not managed to achieve the same success as earlier titles like Empire, Empire Four Kingdoms, and Big Farm. As a result of the layoffs, Good Game Studios stopped development of games like Legends of Honor. If you're interested to learn more about what happened to that project, I made a separate video on it a few years back, which I'll include a link to in the video description. Good Game Studios had apparently also been trying to enter the core games market with a new project it was developing in Unreal Engine 4. We know essentially nothing about that project other than that it was supposed to be an action RPG. Perhaps some of these images, available on Good Game Studios' website, provide an indication of what the artwork would have been like. Needless to say, however, the Unreal Engine 4 project never came to fruition. I can't help but wonder what it would have been like had Good Game Studios somehow crossed into being a mainstream game developer or put out a game that wasn't free-to-play. Out of all of Good Game Studios' games, these layoffs likely had the least impact on Empire, which was both Good Game Studios' most successful title, as well as squarely within its core focus on the free-to-play browser and mobile markets. Observant players may have noticed some changes, though, including volunteer moderators taking the place of community manager employees on the forums. In September, the Alliance Tournament made another attempt at a comeback. This time, the task was once again collecting glory. The catch was that the event would only run while the Foreigner or Blood Crow invasions were active. In an October Q4 roadmap, Good Game Studios announced its focus for the rest of the year would be on implementing bug fixes, launching an open beta test server, automating tasks like recruitment so as to make bots obsolete, rebalancing offense and defense, updating old event rewards, and reworking the production of Kingdom Resources. 
one of these changes, the open beta test server, did actually appear by December. For many players, the test server was their first opportunity to pretend as if they bought rubies and to get to rapidly progress through the game. I made a video which essentially was a time lapse of exactly that. You're watching a clip of it now, but I'll link to the full thing in the video description. The promise of the open beta test server was that Good Game Studios could enlist players to help find and fix bugs before new features were added to the live version of the game. This showed a certain commitment to improving the game's balance and stability, as well as a sense of respect for the substantial time and money players had invested into their actual accounts. Well, there you have it. Build items, blood crows, open betas, and the battle for the royal capital. 2016 had a nice alliterative ring to it, don't you think? Thanks for watching, and thanks for helping the channel once again surpass 10,000 subscribers. We're about halfway through the series now, but if you're still not subscribed, you can get subscribed to make sure you're alerted of future videos. Anyways, I've been Brior, and I'll see you next time.